This is Chemical Processes for Micro Nano Fabrication. I'm Chris Mack and this is Lecture 27, Device Isolation. Our reading it will be the first three sections of Chapter 15 of our textbook by Campbell. This is a little different than some of the other uh, recent lectures. Instead of talking about some of the unit processes used in chip making, and I'll talk about how and why those unit processes are used to accomplish a specific task, in this case isolating devices. Why do we need a device isolation? Well, we, we, were, we are building transistors in a silicon substrate. And we'll put two transistors next to each other. Well, what's in between those two transistors that we have just built? A silicon wafer. Uh, in this case, on the picture shown here, a P-doped silicon substrate. Well, silicon wafer conducts and it has electrical properties and if we have two transistors very close to each other, they might interact with each other in ways that we did not intend. So we need to isolate uh, somehow one transistor from the other so that they can both behave independently when we apply signals and voltages, etc. Let's take a look at this example. This is a CMOS example. We've seen it before in our lecture on an overview of CMOS process flow. Here we have an N MOS transistor, an N channel transistor. This is the gate in the gray. We have the N plus source and drain regions in a P substrate. If we apply uh, a voltage across the source to the drain, uh, it will conduct depending on the voltage in the gate. If I apply the right voltage on the gate, I open up an N channel and we get the flow of current. Over here I have a PMOS device. Uh, I build an N well, then I use P plus source and drain regions, the same gate above uh, an oxide over the, the N well, and if I apply the right voltage above the threshold voltage here, I will create a P channel um, between them. But what I don't want is for this device to talk to this device when they're both operating independently. So the device isolation is to prevent that. How, how could these devices talk to each other? Let's take a closer look. Here we have a P substrate. Here we have an N plus uh, drain. And here we have the N well. Well, this looks kind of like N, P, N, uh, similar to my N MOS device here. And if this looks like a, uh, an NMOS device, and here's an oxide, uh, if I happen to have, say, a metal line or polysilicon line running across there to make a connection uh, and, and it applied a voltage, it would turn on a transistor. This is called a parasitic transistor. It acts like a transistor, but we don't want it to be a transistor. We need to somehow turn that transistor off or prevent that transistor from ever turning on, from ever conducting current. How can we do that? Well, if in between uh, the P substrate and whatever might be above it is an oxide, that will act like the gate oxide of an MOS transistor. But we can make this transistor have a much higher threshold voltage by making that oxide thickness larger. And that's our goal. We're going we're gonna to put an oxide that's very, very thick in this region between the two transistors so that if any metal line were to run over it, created an MOS parasitic transistor, uh, we wouldn't have enough voltage in our supply lines. Suppose it were just a, a metal line carrying the supply voltage across the chip. It wouldn't be enough voltage to turn on that transistor and we wouldn't get any accidental conduction of current from one device to another. That's the goal. And our isolation thus will be a large uh, thick oxide isolating the different active areas. So we call this region the field oxide, uh, and this is the field region, and this is the active area where we actually are building our transistor. So we have active areas separated using field oxides. There are two common approaches to device isolation today. Um, one of them is the, the older approach. Uh, LOCOS, the local oxidation of silicon, so LOCOS is our acronym. It was popular in the 70s and 80s, uh, very, very widespread use in MOS devices. 
but around 1990, late 80s, early 90s, it was replaced by shallow trench isolation. This has been the preferred method since the 250 nanometer technology generation, so you know mid 90s uh, time frame. Now, both are still in use today, locos for older devices, um, but mainly we're going to study locos for its historical significance and to point out the differences between a loco system and an STI isolation system. So let's look at the process. Here are the uh, the basic steps. First, I'm going to deposit um, this pad oxide shown here in the, the brown. Then I'll put a silicon nitride layer and then a photoresist layer. So this film stack uh, is created. Uh, I'll explain what the purposes of each of these are as we go. The photoresist will be used in our lithography process. We haven't talked about lithography yet, but we're going to be able to pattern uh, a, a a feature. So we'll expose and develop an etch to create uh, an etched region. So I've got my silicon dioxide with silicon nitride on top of it and then I open up a region where we're going to build our field oxide or isolating oxide between the devices. So where the pad oxide and the silicon nitride remain, those will be our active areas. What I'm doing with the nitride is covering up the portion of the silicon wafer where I do not want oxidation to occur. So my next step, shown here in step five, is thermal oxidation. I'll uh, put it in a furnace and I'll grow with thermal oxide. Well, silicon nitride is a very um, a good diffusion barrier for the oxidants, either a wet or a dry oxidation process, O2 or H2O will not diffuse through silicon nitride. And as a result, we do not get oxidation occurring underneath the silicon nitride. Instead, in the region where this, the silicon wafer is exposed, we get growth of oxide. Now recall that uh, the oxide growth occurs uh, by both growing down into the silicon and up. Right? So this, this thickness of silicon dioxide is about 2 0.2 times the thickness of silicon consumed. So the interface moves down and uh, the, with, the, with the wafer and the interface with the air moves up. And we form uh, our field oxide in this region. Now what happens to this nitride? You know, we, we think of this process as being one dimensional, growing up, but what about right at this interface? Well, we're going to get some growth here too because we get a little bit of diffusion that goes under the, the silicon nitride, right? In, in fact, it'll diffuse under just about as readily as it'll diffuse down. So it's kind of an isotropic diffusion process. So we get just as much diffusion to the left and right as we do down. And so this interface starts creeping, starts growing under the silicon nitride. Well, that pushes up the silicon nitride and we get a lot of stress here in the film as it bends up. That's what this pad oxide for was for. Remember we we first applied a pad oxide, uh, then, um, and that's just the name of it, it's just silicon dioxide. We just call it a pad oxide because it acts as a pad for the, for the silicon nitride. And it helps to relieve the stress. So we get much less stress at this interface region than we would have if we didn't have this thin silicon dioxide uh, layer underneath it. It's maybe 100 nanometers thick um, versus a 3 to 500 nanometer thick silicon nitride. Then we strip off the silicon nitride and we're left with this structure. This is our final field oxide, that's what we call this region, uh, and it's our device isolation layer. Let's look at some of the properties of this locos process. First of all, we have this encroaching shape that, that sneaks in underneath the nitride. Because of its characteristic shape, we call it a bird's beak. Well, it just looks like the beak of the bird, of a bird, so uh, we call it a bird's beak phenomenon. And you see that it grows underneath the nitride to about the same thickness as the field oxide itself, same distance as the thickness of the field oxide. Um, this is a problem. Uh, to get good isolation, we want thick oxides, but 
every time we make the oxide thicker, the, the bird's beak grows. And as a result, uh, we, um, uh, we lose valuable area. So this region where the bird's beak exists is not good for anything. It's not good at isolating one device from another, and we can't use that region for actually building a device. It's wasted space. Space on a silicon wafer is very valuable. It's valuable real estate, and this low-cost process results in bird's beaks on either side of the field oxide that is wasted space. Um, let me also mention that we'll often do an implant into the silicon dioxide just before we grow this field oxide. So you recall that we have an opening uh, in uh, our silicon nitride uh, layer and we can implant to create uh, a higher doping in this region. The purpose of that is to make it harder to turn on this transistor. So now we, we're adjusting the doping level to get a higher V threshold turn on voltage for the parasitic transistor. Then we have the thick oxide. Both of these things combined help to make the, the turn on voltage large. We, we want V threshold to be maybe twice the supply voltage. So again, the supply voltage will be the highest voltage anywhere in the circuit. And if the threshold voltage is twice the supply voltage, it's very, very unlikely that we'll be able to turn this transistor on and we won't get any leakage of current between our devices. Well, that's the basic locus process. Let's look at STI, shallow trench isolation. Uh, we call it shallow trench because there's also deep trench isolation processes, uh, which are sometimes used, but are not as po uh, popular as these shallow trenches. Shallow and deep is a relative term, uh, but we do have uh, this deep trench isolation process as well. So what, what do we do here? We, we start the process in a very similar way to locos. We have a, a pad oxide here uh, with silicon nitride on top of it and photoresist, and we pattern the photoresist. But now, instead of just etching through the nitride and the pad ox, I'm going to etch a trench down into the silicon wafer. It's going to be shallow compared to the deep processes, but it's still relatively deep you know, maybe a half a micron down. And in a modern process, uh, this width is, is much smaller than the depth, so the aspect ratio is high. We'll strip the resist, step three, and actually do just a little bit of undercut of the silicon nitride. All right, I'll explain why we're doing that in just a moment. <coughs> uh, so we do this, this little undercut, then we're going to do a small thermal oxidation. This thermal oxidation uh, creates what we call a liner oxide. It's very thin. It's just enough to relieve the stress on the silicon sidewalls um, when we do our next step. So this is all silicon oxide here, thermal oxide, very dense. And because we did this little undercut before, the result is a rounding of the corners up at the top of the silicon, silicon dioxide interface. This rounding is going to be very important for getting good device characteristics when we build our devices. Then we're going to fill up this, uh, this trench with silicon dioxide. Now we can't grow the silicon dioxide. Uh, instead, we need to deposit it with a CVD process. And, and this is why we needed this liner oxide. Without the liner oxide, we get all kinds of defects. Uh, as we fill this up, we will generate stress between the silicon and the silicon dioxide, and uh, the result will be uh, defects in the silicon, uh, which will affect the device performance. Remember, this is isolating between two transistors, one on the right and one on the left. And so this is the area where we're actually going to be building our transistors. Well, we deposit the silicon dioxide everywhere on the wafer, it has to fill up these trenches, but then it will cover up over the top of our nitride as well. Our next step is CMP, chemical mechanical polishing. We're going to talk about that in just a couple of lectures, 
but suffice it to say I'm going to use a polishing pad that that polishes down uh, the oxide just kind of grinds it off uh, don't tell a CMP person that you're grinding we never grind we're always polishing it's much more refined uh, so we polish off uh, this this oxide until it hits the silicon nitride and that acts as a, as a polish stop and we'll stop there when we're done with our CMP we'll strip the nitride and we're left with the structure that looks like this we see a trench between two active areas that is filled with silicon dioxide. As we saw with the locos process, we'll probably do an implant step right about here, uh, step three before we uh, maybe before whoops, either before or after our our uh, liner oxide deposition, we'll do an implant to change the threshold voltage uh, uh, of whatever parasitic MOS transistor will be formed in this isolation region. So the advantages of the STI process, well it's the dominant isolation approach today uh, because it uses less area. This allows for greater transistor density, packing more densities, more transistors in a given area on the wafer lowers the cost of each chip and that's very valuable. Um, as we scale down to smaller and smaller dimensions we can keep the trench depth fairly large, even though we call it shallow trench isolation, uh, relative to the width of the trench, uh, this depth is, is quite large. So we can keep decreasing the trench width as we scale our processes to smaller and smaller dimensions, keeping the depth of the trench relatively large so that we continue to get good isolation. This is not easy to do. What does it require? Well, first we have to have a good etch process that can perform a deep etch, uh, deep in the sense that uh, the aspect ratio, the width is small compared to how deep it is. Um, and that's hard to do from an etch perspective. Also we have to be able to fill this up well with an oxide and get a good quality oxide film. Um, as we've seen, CVD oxide is not as dense as uh, thermal oxide, but still it has to be sufficient quality to serve as a good insulator. And finally we have to develop a CMP process. So all of these new processes had to be developed in order to make STI practical. And uh, that's been true of a lot of the advances in semiconductor device structures over the, the last 50 years. We have to have advances in processing technology to be able to enable these new structures that we want to build. So what have we learned about device isolation? You should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions, if not go back and review the material. Why is device isolation needed? What are the two most common device isolation processes? And finally, why is STI the more common today? Uh, all right, so I gave you one of the answers to the previous question, STI. Um, anyways, uh, this is a section on isolating the devices. We've seen the use of other process steps that we've uh, described before, things like uh, CVD, um, thermal growth, but we've also seen some process steps we haven't talked about yet, and we'll get to those. Lithography, etch, CMP. As you can see, it takes a lot of individual steps to create even a relatively simple structure like uh, a trench isolation. Next time we're going to talk about some other important structures that we're going to use to build our devices, interconnections, wires that connect up one transistor to another. Till then.